Ah, I have it. Um, look, uh, we start with Father, in John 17. It's a call. It's a statement that uh, I want to think this through with you. I'm praying. Um, it, it, certainly it gives the relationship and so on, but it's also the relationship is being one of the advantages of the relationship being stressed at the very outset is that I'm making myself aware of your presence in what I'm about to say. I want what I say to be influenced by what I understand to be you. In fact, more than that, what is you, whether I understand it or not? Well, wow. so it's the right opening gambit, if you like, to all the thoughts and words that are going to follow, I hope, or have a need to say. So I open with Father, or Heavenly Father, or Our Father, Um, if I'm modifying it, I'm saying, oh, hang on, I think I don't have the right to just call you. I'm respecting the fact that it's your grace that brings me into your company. Now, John 17 doesn't start with that. It just says, Father. And there may be good reason for that. I'm not quite sure what that is, as opposed to him saying, our Father, or Heavenly Father, or even my Father. Perhaps stating ownership's not quite right. Um, at least it implies exclusive ownership. Our Father is the collectively more appropriate, especially if we're speaking as a group anyway, of course. Hmm. Now, the Our Father, which art in heaven, you know, who is in heaven? Well, he knows that. You apparently know that. Why are you saying it? Well, either because it's a teaching situation. Um, or is it simply to remind yourself? Having put it in words, you've reminded yourself very concretely out there that you are thinking of God in a certain context. In this case, that he's in heaven. Of course, if you had the teaching of Jesus with you, you will know that te the heaven isn't, in some sense, just up there. You know, Jesus lifts his eyes to heaven. But that heaven is definitely within you. Now, I tend to think, oh, well, if heaven's in me, it's in my heart. I, th I, I tend to think of the chest. You know, I'm thinking of a physical location, really. <laughs> um, whereas me is not the body anyway, so why do I locate it where the body is? Because that's where I seem to be focused at the minute. In other words, we're saying, is it that we're saying God is with us, if you have t Jesus' teaching that the kingdom of heaven is within you? Are we saying when Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven in John 17, uh, that in some sense it's above, as in the starry universe above us, beyond the sun and so on? Or are we looking up because in some sense we're focusing like the Eastern people do? Uh, the point between the eyebrows where we concentrate. You know, it's that link between the two sides of the brain where two, two minds come together, our left and right hemisphere, <laughs> the third eye or something, if you're thinking in uh, Buddhist terms or, um, well, Eastern terms, Hindu as well, isn't it? Um, what's perhaps symbolically referred to when we say looking east. You know, we 
Anglicans, anyway, I say we, the Anglicans had their altars such that when you're at the altar, as a member of the church, you're looking at the east. Right, this might be symbolically towards Jerusalem, given you're in the west. Um, you know, if you've got those sort of spatial ideas in mind. Uh, I don't know what happens if you're Jew east of Jerusalem, do you face the other way? If you're an Anglican church, perhaps there are no Anglican churches that are east of Jerusalem. No, that's not true. Uh, we've got some in India, haven't we? Yeah, I don't know. Abandon this is not helping. <laughs> now, do you see my thoughts have actually drifted from being influenced by awareness of the presence of God to simply being rambling in the thoughts? And the thoughts are exclusively of sorting out some knotty problem which is no need to be sorted out and isn't being ostensibly influenced, outwardly obviously influenced by my awareness of God. Whereas prayer is that. We're thinking, but thinking in an environment where we're imagining, if you like, the presence of God, but it's there in our thoughts. And that is making the thinking so much more blessing and productive. Now we're understanding, our understanding is that God allows us to call upon his name. And that we establish the relationship at the beginning of the prayer. He's our Father, Heavenly Father, wonderful, magnificent person. And we are his child his son, his daughter, whatever. And we're saying, we're presenting to ourselves, we're putting it out there. I'm going to think this through, subject to an awareness of you. And that's what makes all the difference to what you come up with, the thoughts you have. If you like, because your mind is now drawing on God's store of thought, much more appropriately than when you just think on your own without that awareness of God in the thinking process. Yeah, this is life eternal, to know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ in thou sent to know. In other words, to be thinking of correctly, of course. To know God. Well, it's to be awesomely affected by who he is, isn't it? When you know someone they have influence over you. Can I say for a minute, elevating idea, but he knows us. He's influenced by us. We might be small compared to uh, his infinite personhood in some sense, but See, we're in fellowship. We do influence God, our Father. My kids unquestionably influence me. That's the joy of having them. <laughs> Love you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. So, when I'm, when I'm recording, I'm, very much aware of you, not just God, I say just, but you know what I mean, not God alone, but you as well in the conversation. If I'm not careful, I start to end up just more aware of you, uh, 
perhaps because I've got some teaching in intention. And then I'm less and less aware of you, but more and more just in the problem of trying to find the answer or a solution or an understanding. And I've lost awareness of both God and you now. And that's not safe in that it's lost God, in a sense, not safe, the way my thoughts are wandering. And not a blessing to you in that I'm less aware of you. Well, I'm not aware of you at all by then. I'm just lost in the thoughts. And probably lost is the appropriate word. And, and, and that's what's wrong with a conversation between two people, where one is really not listening to the other at all. They've lost awareness of the person they're talking to, and they're lost in their own torrent of words and ideas and thoughts. And they've forgotten whether it's relevant to the person they're talking to. It's getting extremely bored and hoping this conversation will finish shortly. Um, now that's reckoned to be a really bad conversation. It's not a conversation at all. It's me giving you a talk, me giving a lecture, whether you're interested in it or not. And after a while, of course, you're not because it's not relating to you. He's not aware of you and your needs. You're just carrying on with something he wants to do. And the talk goes on and on, and you think, this person never going to finish. Now, what we're saying then with prayer is, your mind has to be kept, therefore, on the person you're talking to, in this case, God. Um, now, when I'm talking to you, I, I do this by pausing and listening to what you're thinking, what you're saying. And perhaps we should be doing the same when we're, we're praying to God, that there should be much pauses, many pauses, you know, quite long pauses, or, or In other words, somehow we should be listening, but you say, hang on, you're listening to someone who doesn't speak to you in words. Only in the thoughts that come to you in the listening. But if you're not careful, the thoughts aren't received in the context of the presence of God. They're just thought after thought, and you, your mind wanders off, oblivious to God's presence. And it is the awareness of God's presence in the thinking process that makes it prayer, not just think, simply thought. That ideally all our thoughts, I guess, guess is a funny word to use here, I, I get the impression that it is best that all our thoughts are done in the awareness of God. There are certain thoughts we have in emergencies that have to be carried out extremely quickly. Um, but that shouldn't be our ongoing situation, our normal, usual situation. Our usual living affords us plenty of time to make, I would think, the opportunity for our thinking to be in an awareness of God. So that we, as Paul says, pray without ceasing now, is that we are thinking, aware of God's presence continually. Our thoughts are being in relation to him. That makes it prayer. Hmm. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Perhaps that's why we see in John 17, Jesus not just saying Father at the beginning of the prayer, but something like a total of six times he refers to Father in a you know, relatively short prayer, isn't it? Is it 24, 26 verses long, whatever it is? Um, you know, suddenly he says Holy Father or Righteous Father or Father or 
he reminds himself in the conversation that it is with God, not just in thinking, not just in teaching how to pray for our sake. You know, even John 17, the fact that it's written down, it's in the Gospels, in some sense it's the part of the story coming to us and is therefore we assume part of an intention to teach us. Which is why, of course, I feel that John 17 is so important. It's a prayer to God. This has to be another aspect of teach us how to pray. This is him presented as praying, talking to God on a very serious time when he's going to leave or has left. That they be with me where I am, suggests he's already left in some, some spiritual sense at least. Mm. At this point of the story. Thank you, Father. Of course, when we get into the thinking process, we're often much more aware of the thinking process than who we're thinking it with. Um, and referring back to like Father or Righteous Father does achieve that, I think. It puts us back on track. It's not that we're calling God's attention again, but our own back to his presence in the thinking process, in the prayer, that we are in prayer, we're not just thinking a thing through. Mm. Another point I want to touch on is that if, and I mean I'm in a world of uncertainty, um, that it is all thought that the universe is more like a dream than a reality, as we see it. That, as in some scriptures where God speaks the word and it comes to pass, what you believe or think firmly in your heart comes to be, perhaps slowly, unfolds because you start to follow a different course of action that brings it about, or perhaps instantly, like in a dream where things just change. Um, in hindsight, in this, this dream reality, we can find explanation for it. But explanations themselves are rather strange phenomena. They are ways of settling our mind that what's happened is consistent with everything else in our world. So I might say, well, he was suffering cancer, uh, the preacher prayed for him, and he seemed to be healed on the spot. And he is healed. I mean, it's not cropped up. It's a good few months now, and he, he seems to have got healed. How fantastic. And they say, now, that's not normal in my experience, eh? Um, so I make it intelligible by saying, well, God has performed a miracle, perhaps he answered. Um, the request, the prayer, which is what the preacher intended, of course. So perhaps it's something to do with at least the intentionality of the preacher in, in praying it. I didn't risk praying it, I'd look a complete fool asking for, you know, um, and so forth. Um, but the preacher did, and seems to be the answer of a righteous person or a prayer, earnest prayer. God apparently will respond. That looks as though God exists in that case. Do you see, we've, we're starting to piece together an explanation for what is otherwise unintelligible to us. It's just stunned and amazed. Well, he was ill and now he's not. I've no idea why. Isn't that amazing? Even that statement starts to be 
you know, we've had other situations that are amazing, haven't we? It's not so abnormal. It's something I can classify as one of those things I can't can't classify <laughs> or can't explain. Do you see where we're eternally trying to make sense of any sense in the absence of anything better out of our world and what's happening? Because if there is no sense, then of course there's no hope of predictability, manipulation, control. We're at the mercy of things. Whereas if there is a possibility that it's all making sense, all I have to do, I say all, but in some sense it's handleable. Conceivably I could find out what the sense is. And I'm not going to find out what that sense is unless I look. So I'm out there to believe, and uh, perhaps it's so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, okay, if it is, then let's exercise that and see if it always is the case. Or when is it the case that this type of phenomenon tends to work? Well, when it's a righteous man, or when it's a person who really does think they, that it's going to happen. He believes it's going to happen when he says it. Whereas that person doesn't believe and it doesn't happen except occasionally, and then you think, oh, well, perhaps I live in a world of random chance where some things can happen, unlikely, but they can happen. That doesn't destroy my rationality model in my mind of the world. It's still manageable. It's manageable now in this way. I accredit it as being part of a certain group of phenomena or whatever, you see. So, I think that's what's going on. Do you see that is self? In itself starts to move you towards a better handleability of the world. A more likely set of procedures that finds out explanations for. If I understand um, certain relationships in the world, I can control my world better and I'm more successful in some sense. I achieve what I value or, or can potentially. It's like the scientist, isn't it? He, he, he assumes, always used to before quantum theory anyway, he assumes that nothing's random and all you've got to do is un uncover, unreveal to yourself by thought and experiment and, and testing and so forth. Um, what the relationship between things is. And, and it's very much in that line that we're doing. But I'm going to transcend this explanation again. I'm going to say, yeah, and perhaps there's a class, a group of things where if you think them firmly enough, they come about. For instance, as in a dream, if I think so and so is going to happen, that can anticipate in the dream it actually happening. You may have experienced this. You may not have done, but you can experience it. Some people have, I have. I don't mean I do this with all dreams. But you know. Perhaps there's a class of reality that's like this too, what we call reality, this dream of uncertainty, space, time, matter, change. Perhaps that too is subject to my thoughts. Not just the Supreme Creator's thoughts now, or by perhaps permission of the Supreme Creator, if, if one exists, that my thoughts can influence his thoughts. There are circumstances perhaps when he will honour my thoughts with it materialising in this dream creation of the world of uncertainty that we live in. It's a possibility, isn't it? How can you test it? Well, practice. See. And there's some people who do practice, like my friend Jeff. My goodness, he seems to have a ministry of casting out demons. I mean, I might not think of picturesque demons, but he pictures them as entities and casts them out. And oh, the point is, he gets an incredible number of healings, which is otherwise inexplicable to me. 
That doesn't mean to say I jump in and accept his theology, but I'm certainly intrigued as to why it's working. And I may come up with another explanation as to why it's working, but it may be equally bizarre from a what's considered normal view point of view. And the one I come up with, of course, is that no, we also have a certain sovereignty allowed to us, perhaps, by God, to influence what we call reality. Certainly we do in the longer run, if I you know, get the impression I want to do, I don't know, go to university, I start to pursue such things that will make it possible and keep looking for ways of opening up the possibility of me doing so. And it coming about doesn't always work, don't always achieve what I set out to do, but very often it does. Um, it certainly seems to be influenced in the long run. What I think unquestionably affects what I do. Not entirely, of course. I mean, I might imagine being a brain sh surgeon, but I'm not trained in such. Well, mm, good luck to you, mate. But, uh, well, you've got to imagine a lot of training first, okay? In general. But perhaps not if you have the miraculous abilities. And perhaps some do. Perhaps some have an ability to think which invades what we would otherwise call concrete, unyielding reality. Reality is in fact very yielding. Most amazing and unusual things are true in this apparent reality of this universe. We get the impression, don't we, that a person who's convinced he's going to die seems to set the odds in favour of him dying. A um, person who thinks they can't achieve something unquestionably affects their ability to achieve it. A person who thinks they can win starts to do all sorts of things that help it to win. Much more likely to achieve it. Okay, that's in a rather long more reasonable, you might think, extension of time, and this consistent with our experience, of course. I mean, I don't get up to make a cup of tea unless I actually think I can do it. And if I do think I can do it, I might well get up and make a cup of tea if I'm thirsty, and so forth. I don't drink tea, by the way, but <laughs> I used to, okay. Okay, why don't you drink tea, Marsh? Ah. Oh. Because it influences one's um, uh, thoughts, one's ability and reasonable to think, one's energy, it's an artificial stimulant. I think I'd like to avoid it in case the uh, continual artificial stimulants are not good. I've reason to think that many of them aren't. I think I'll keep away from tea. You know, that's the, what the reasoning. Yeah? In other words, I'm clear that what I think will influence my welfare, or at least think it could do. Reasonably, so I take certain steps accordingly. What I think affects the world I live in. What we're saying is that what you're thinking may seem to affect it in a supernatural way, in that things manifest according to certain penetrating thoughts, said if you like, with great faith or conviction. And that's the Jesus teaching, isn't it? You say to this mountain, be cast into the sea, and it will obey you. Do I expect this mountain, Mount Perongius, lurking the other side of the lake in the far distance to obey me? No, I don't. Um, can I practice moving it and practice believing enough? Not really. I think it's going to take a, 
more faith than I reasonably anticipate having. In other words, I'm dead in the water with that project before I start, aren't I? Can I overcome it? I don't think it's likely, no, and I'm not sure as I wish to move the mountain. It might upset an awful lot of people over there. And where am I going to put this mountain anyway? <laughs> I mean, is he talking in parables? Is he talking in parallels? Does he mean I'm expected to go around moving mountains? Not really, no. It's a bit, a bit more useful what he's um, saying than that. And by useful, I mean a bit more applicable to everyone's life, perhaps, where the mountains simply refer to difficulties, etc. I mean, you don't have to be great, some great Gnostic to, to realize, almost automatically, that that's probably what he meant. Okay. But the literalist is interesting here. He comes around and says, yes, but what happens if he does mean it? it's true as well? Oh! Mm, well, that would be fun, wouldn't it, I think? Hang on. Mm. And there are things that you believe for that miraculously happen very quickly or result in amazing coincidences. And you think, oh, perhaps this is the answer to prayer, this is the hand of God, or this is the result of believing. If we knew for certain, perhaps this world of uncertainty would start to be either chaotic or less certain. I'm not sure. That's an interesting question too. What I am experienced in is the fact that you should do things in a small degree first. Major leaps into the unknown tend to be either impossible or catastrophic. You know, me moving the mountain, uh, literally, uh, possibly either impossible or catastrophic. Um, more likely impossible than catastrophic, too, in my mind. But that's just because of my view. Some things are not like that. And you could practice. You could practice, you know, well, I need this to happen. I've got nothing to lose if it doesn't happen. I'm going to believe for it happening. Wow, it did. So and so turned up. Amazing synchronicity of events. And things worked. Got an answer to prayer. An answer to my faith and my trust. And then it seems clear you can move on to bigger situations or, you know, such situations become less risky than they would have otherwise been. And perhaps more feasible, your faith grows because of success with small things. You know, perhaps there is a rational link that the practice starts to make you believe that some things can, especially the small things that's happened before. I've got much more expectation that it could happen again now could happen again. It happened last time. Hmm. Coming back to then the subject of these two recordings so far, this one and the previous one. Prayer may be also bringing the miraculous. God simply sovereignly answering, changing the course of events. Why he should want to change the course of events from what he was going to do otherwise before you asked him is not clear. Perhaps he knew he was going to have the miracle, a bit like Jesus says, well, it's um, not for all the explanations that this man's been healed, but that the glory of God, he receives his sight through this miracle that you see me performing as you see it. It's for the glory of God, and therefore God may have intended this miracle from outside of time, beginning of time. Or perhaps God is far more able and flexible than you suppose, can achieve any goal in any situation, and give you your freedom, and him in some sense not know or suspend knowing the future, until it transpires. 
we don't know. What we do know is there are many cases of an answer to prayer. And that is a reality you have to take into account as regards your understanding. And greatly influences the degree to which you have faith and trust in your prayer not simplistically, although perhaps majorly, transforming your life, but what we might term supernaturally resulting in outcomes that you're praying for. Standing back from the analysis though, it's a zero sum. It's a, it's a win-win rather situation. I'm going to pray. It may just in a mundane way improve my chances of things happening in, this, in the world's secular sense of chance, the unknown. It may on the other hand be a contact with the divine, with our God, who brings things about according to my importunity and urgent need. I think the latter is quite likely to be the case, more so from my experience, my experience, perhaps not yours, but certainly mine. Why it happens, I'm not sure, because I'm concerned that the usual thesis that why would he want to do something to what he knew was best before? Perhaps because in my, in some sovereignty he's given me, I'm asking for something which I want very much, and that although it's not the ideal, he will respond to that and change the course of events that he was going to do. Because my understanding that he loves and cares for me might be more important than me getting to the right spiritual state in the most efficient way. He knows the most efficient way. But given he's also taking into account the sovereignty of myself, if indeed he is, I, I think he is. Then he responds to prayer. In other words, he's setting us up with a situation where we are meaningful persons to fellowship with, despite still being children and having therefore a very imperfect competence. Hmm. In other words, we're in the making, and this is the way he's making us. This is the way he's training us, bringing us to completion as a wonderful being in his family, the heavenly host. To be with him, by the looks of it, perhaps forever, always. Thank you, Heavenly Father.